Imagine with John Lennon, a world with no religion. Imagine no suicide bombers, no 9-11, no 7-7, no crusades, no witch hunts, no gunpowder plots, no Indian partition, no Israeli-Palestinian wars, no Serb-Croat Muslim massacres, no persecution of Jews as Christ killers, no Northern Ireland troubles, no honor killings, no shiny suited, bouffant haired, televangelists fleecing gullible people of their money. God wants you to give till it hurts. Imagine no Taliban to blow up ancient statues, no public beheadings of blasphemers, no flogging of females for showing their skin. Richard Dawkins, the author of The God Delusion, is an evolutionary biologist at Oxford University. He's won several prestigious awards in the field of science. Dawkins has also written a number of books, most famously The Selfish Gene and The Blind Watchmaker. He's a very unapologetic atheist and contends that religion, just like anything else, should be questioned extensively. The God Delusion illustrates how the concept of a supernatural, intelligent, all-knowing being who created the universe is a false belief. The God Hypothesis is that there exists a superhuman, supernatural, human intelligence who deliberately designed the universe and everything in it and created us. The alternative view that the book presents is that any creative intelligence of sufficient complexity to design anything to come into existence is only the product of an extensive process of gradual evolution. Evolution is the only way to answer the question of how and why we are here. One of the most used arguments used for the existence of God is Thomas Aquinas's five proofs. One, beyond unmoved mover. Nothing moves without a prior mover. This leads us to regress from which the only escape is God. Someone had to make the first move, and that's something we call God. Two, the uncaused cause. Nothing is caused by itself. Every effect has a prior cause, and again, we are pushed back into regress. <laughs> This has to be terminated by a first cause, which we call God. Three, the cosmological argument. There must have been a time when no physical things existed, but since physical things exist now, there must have been something non-physical to bring them into existence. And that's something we call God. Four, the argument from degree. We notice that things in the world differ. There are diff differences of goodness and perfection, but we judge these differences only by comparison. With the maximum, humans can be both good and bad, so the maximum goodness cannot rest in us. Therefore, there must be some other maximum to set the standard for perfection, and we call that maximum God. Five, the teleological argument, argument from design. Things in the world, especially living things, look as though they have been designed. Nothing that we know looks designed unless it is designed. Therefore, it must have been a designer, and we call him God. <clears throat> Richard Dawkins says that these reasons are really very weak, and gives reasons for his statements. For the first three proofs, the unmoved mover, the uncaused cause, the cosmological argument, Aquinas has to assume, without other proof, that God himself is somehow not susceptible to the regress, and that God then stops the regress. Even if God can avoid the regress, nothing about these proofs says God has supernatural qualities, such as unlimited authority, unlimited awareness, and as humans, we need to worship and pray to this assumed deity. The fourth proof, the argument from degree, says that by default, we must assume God is the ultimate goodness. If there is no proof of this ultimate goodness, Dawkins suggests that if we can use ultimate goodness as a proof, then that would be the same as we can only know if something actually smells by comparing it to the ultimate smelliness. The final proof, the teleological argument, is the one most used even today and has been viewed as the ultimate argument. Charles Darwin discounted this argument by saying that just because something is complex doesn't mean that it's intention by design. Natural selection can create something very complex in small steps. An example Dawkins gives is the nervous system, which shows goal-seeking behavior that even in insects shows immense complexity. Dawkins states that there is almost certainly no God. He uses the improbability argument in the opposite direction that a creationist uses it. Creationists and theists would say that it is very improbable that the world is complex as it is, is was constructed without an intelligent design. Dawkins then utilizes the ultimate 
Boeing 747 theory, which states that if a hurricane blew through a scrapyard, the chances of a fully functional 747 being assembled is next to nothing. The creationists would wrongly say that the Boeing 747 analogy is proof there would have to be an intelligent designer, because the other option is that the plane was built randomly by chance. Dawkins contends that chance is not even an option. Both sides of the argument, for and against the existence of God, concede to the point that complex things cannot be constructed due to chance. If the creationist is right, then the question that follows is who designed the designer? And that line of questioning would be infinite because nobody can find the actual end. The correct way to view the Boeing 747 analogy is that it is not the proof of an intelligent designer, but the product of natural selection. Dawkins' theories fall in line with Darwinism. He explains natural selection. If you imagine a mountain with one side being a sheer cliff and the other side being a gradual incline, the overnight change was a theory of intelligent design would be the cliff that you'd have to get from the bottom to the top in one giant leap. The gradual side would be evolution, which happens slowly over a long period of time to go from the bottom to the top. Clearly, it is much more feasible to get to the top gradually rather than all at once. Another example would be to say that half of an eye is better than no eye at all. What is meant by this is that it is better be able to see with blurred vision than to not see at all. A possible simple evolution of an eye would be a flatworm that can only see shades of light and dark, an anatolis that can see an image but not as good as humans, or a human eye that can see images, colors sharply. Along the same lines, you could also say that half of a wing is better than no wing at all. If a bird falls from a branch on a tree, it will feel better with half of a wing than if it had no wing at all. Those descendants are more likely to survive than descendants that did not have a wing. So the ones that survive reproduce and so on and so forth until a fully functional wing is developed. There are countless more examples that can be said exactly the same way, showing the truth behind evolution. So why can't people choose to believe in religion and a supreme being if they want to? What harm could it possibly do? Dawkins says there are many, many reasons why the concept of religion is so dangerous. One of the big reasons is that when one is questioning religion, a religion person may end up being an absolutist. Every religion has its own spectrum of religious extremists and moderates that can breed absolutism. An example of religious absolutism is the controversial story of Abdullah Rahman. In current day Afghanistan, which was set up by America, Rahman was sentenced to death in 2006 for changing his mind and deciding to become a Christian. He did not hurt anyone. He simply made up his own mind and decided something for himself. This was not acceptable. He was able to get out of the death sentence because he pleaded insanity and because the story got in the world's attention and there was a lot of pressure for him to not be killed. Rahman had to go to Italy so he could get away from people who thought that it was their Islamic duty to murder him. Other examples of religious absolutism are the many American religious leaders and faith-based politicians who have been coined the American Taliban. These are people who openly disparage others from not having the exact same views on life as they do. Ann Coulter, a vocal conservative columnist, has said we should invade their countries, kill their leaders, and convert them to Christianity. Former Republican Congressman Bob Dornan has said, don't use the word gay unless it is an acronym for Got AIDS Yet? Pat Robertson, the founder of the Christian Coalition, has been quoted as saying, homosexuals want to come into our churches and disrupt church services and throw blood all around and try to give people AIDS and spit in the faces of ministers. He's also said, Planned Parenthood is teaching kids to fornicate, teaching people to have adultery, every kind of bestiality, homosexuality, lesbianism, everything that the Bible condemns. George W. Bush is pro-life and for the death penalty, which can be viewed as inconsistent. As governor of Texas, he presided over a vast number of executions. Purportedly, Bush mocked the female prisoner, Carla Faye Tucker, who was begging him for a stay of execution. He mocked her by saying, please, 
Well, he said in mock desperation, don't kill me. Dawkins suggests sarcastically that maybe she should have told Bush that at one time she too was an embryo, and maybe he would have looked at the situation a little differently. This type of thinking, where people take the scriptures literally and as absolute, can lead to societies where intolerance is the only way to be and everything else is wrong. Even in a culture that most people say is made up of moderates and not extremists, the word atheist has a very negative connotation. Studies have shown that more and more people are choosing not to believe in God. But in America, we don't have any open atheists in our top levels of government. It is said that as if you say you are an atheist, it will be political suicide. Moderate thinking can actually breed extremist points of view. Religious absolutists actually believe what they preach. And when you think of examples, how can it be a good thing? Some anti-abortion protesters that blow up clinics and kill doctors and staff actually believe that they are doing the world some good by getting rid of these people. Suicide bombers actually believe that they are a martyr and that is enough for them to leave their families behind and kill themselves. In opposition to a religious absolutist argument, Bertrand Russell said, many people would sooner die than believe. Another example of opposition to religious thinking came from Voltaire who said those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. If you believe that we must respect religious faith simply because it has been viewed as sacred, then which faith is right? And why is it better than another faith or no faith at all? Dawkins says that no faith in any religion is the only sane way to live. Dawkins wrote this book because he hoped that if someone were to read it, they would think about the points he was making and hopefully would become an atheist. He believes the only answer to how we got here is evolution, and that belief in any religion is dangerous because it can be a slippery slope to leading to intolerance.